Yeah, I was born in um, in Wexford, in John Street, number 83 John Street, tiny little house there. Um, born in 1949 and lived in that house till I suppose I was about nine or ten. Playwright Billy Roach is the second youngest of a family of six, three boys and three girls. He grew up in the Wexford of the 50s and 60s. My earliest memories there of not being able to knock the door and we had this trick of knocking the door. Every child on the street had where we would we would hold on to the knocker, not the knocker, the, the handle in the middle of the door, a little kind of a knob. And we'd walk, literally walk up our way up along the side of the, the door and knock it with our feet upside down. That was a little trick that we all had. The family moved around the corner to John's Gate Street when the playwright was 10 and then to the house where the teenage roach would start to dream of fame and fortune. Uh, we did move a third time up to a brand new corporation house and and uh, when I was about 15 or 16. This is the house I would have danced from. Um, it was, you know, the early 60s, the Beatles, the Animals, the Stones, all of that going on and um, I would have... Bought my first mud suits up there. We had a bath, which was unusual, a bath. I mean, I used to live in the bath. And that's really where I, I, I had my probably um, early days of dreaming about being an actor or a singer or not a writer, never a writer, because a writer was a writer was old and wise, we we thought, you know, so you just might get away with being, being the others without being old and wise. At this stage, the focus was very much on music. But I did begin to write songs even before we got to, to, to this third house. I was writing songs. I remember songs like Needles and Pins and Sweets for My Sweets with all these kind of play on words. I remember writing a, a song called Roses for Rose. That was my, <laughs> my Needles and Pins. Um, but eventually uh, I began to play the guitar. And I was taught, taught by my older brother and began to spend a lot of time in my room practicing guitar. Dylan, the Beatles. Donovan and all that stuff would be my main my main influences. And began to write songs and that and learn learn about writing songs. As well as perfecting his songwriting skills at this time, Roach, whether he knew it or not, had already begun collecting material for writing of a different kind. I grew up in my father's bar, which was on the down just off the waterfront in Wexford. Um, my father had been an, an immigrant worker working in England in a, a new town called Stevenage and he was there for seven about seven years, but he returned home to clean up this this waterfront bar that had had used to be an amazing bar. We were told once upon a time, but now it had really f- uh, fallen into into bad times. Nobody went in there except the drunkest of drunks. Um, at this stage, now I, was, I suppose I was about about fourteen or fifteen. I'd say maybe fourteen when I be, first began to wash glasses in this waterfront bar. My father remembers seeing me just looking. Uh, like I was watching a tennis game with these two guy, men who were about to fight <laughs> and they were insulting each other. And um, now he, at any stage he was ready to, to step in, but uh, he was watching me with fascination. Uh, so somewhere in the, you know, in, in the middle of all that, I was, I was, I was people watching, you know, not realizing and listening, listening to you know, their stories and their their um, their arguments and and whatever. But it was music that would be the first career. Roach sang folk songs in and around Wexford and then spent time in London singing in the pubs and clubs. In the 70s, he was captivated by a new musical style. A new boom was beginning to happen. Punk rock. And I had moved into, into semi, semi-pop semi stuff anyway, away from the folk stuff. And this, 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 um, this punk new wave energy, I, I really got caught up in that. I really loved the energy. Now, I'm not talking about... I, I didn't love the spitting, the jumping and, and all that jazz. I, I loved... It. The ones that came out of that punk rock movement were really the geniuses, the, the Stranglers, the Elvis Costello, Ian Jury and the Blockheads, Graham Parker and the Rumour in particular, um, Tom Robinson Band, wonderful um, songwriters, wonderful lyrics, very intelligent lyrics, all of them, an incredible arrangement. So I, I, I love that and um, eventually formed a band called the Roach Band and we used that energy. And if you listen to the Roach Band songs again, not that you'll find them or anything, but if you do, <clears throat> you'll see that there was a, a narrative going on there. I was aware of Billy Roach because B- Billy um, used to be a rock star in Wexford. He was like a local hero, you know. Wexford-born actor Gary Lydon. And uh, I remember the image, there was an image of him in a video, a rock video, where he's dressed as Charlie Chaplin, you know. And, it's, and it's, he was just really theatrical. like, And you kind of... You know, in retrospect now, you could see 
that he might have got into drama, you know, as such, you know. Before moving towards the theatre, however, Roach started work on a novel, Tumbling Down, and it was at this time that the idea of writing a play first came to the fore. Halfway through writing Tumbling Down, the novel, I came across a chapter that was set in a snooker hall, the members' only room, the outside room that where the youngsters could tap around on a a shabby snooker table while the real table was inside there and the pot-bellied stove was inside and the gamblers and and the men were inside that room. Um, this was something I had witnessed as, as a kid playing around in the snooker halls of Wexford. That they all had a, a privileged room um, somewhere where the, the elite hung out. And... Uh, I was often wondering, oh, what what must I do to get in there? What do you have to what do you have to achieve to to be allowed to sit at that at that poker table and, and all that jazz, you know? <clears throat> so I thought it made a great metaphor for manhood and um, so called manhood. This particular chapter in uh, in my novel Tumbling Down, um, Davy Wolf, the protagonist of the the piece, goes to a snooker hall and he falls foul of the men there and uh, they becomes ridiculed and he's embarrassed and driven driven from the man's world, so to speak. But I, I, I just felt that that would make a wonderful uh, setting for a play. And I always, always usually, anyway, begin with the setting. Um, so you can imagine the snooker hall, the setting is beautiful, there's a jukebox, there's a members-only club and all, and all that, that that entails. And I began to work on my first play, which was originally called The Boca Poker Club. So I was working on Tumbling Down, my first novel, and The Boca Poker Club, which was my first play, at the same time. And I would have worked on the two of them from about 1980 to 1986. I did the original production of um, A Handful of Stars. It was called The Boca Poker Club then, but it changed, the name was changed to A Handful of Stars in the Wexford Arts Centre. Um, then, subsequently to that, it was taken up by the Bush Theatre, directed by Robin Lefebvre, the Bush Theatre in London. Jimmy Brady in A Handful of Stars is uh, he's a small town rebel. He's um, he, he he's rebelling against the strictures of and the oppression of a small town Ireland, you know. And he has uh, he just won't bow down to the pressures of small town life that have been put on him, you know, to conform to. It, it, it did really help me being from Wexford that I was able to for one have been in into the language, into the accent, the language, the musicality of the language as well, you know, and and also, you know, knowing the kind of, the milieu of the plays, you know, to be kind of aware of that and have it lived through it in, in my own youth, you know. And I was, you know, reasonably young when I did it as well, you know what I mean? So I remember when we did the play in the Arts Centre originally, um, we, you know, it was on the, we finished on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, we did a, a Sunday matinee and that was the last show and then we went had a few drinks and then later on we tried to get into White's Disco, you know. And uh, I just finished playing Jimmy Brady, you know, the small town rebel and then trying to get into White's Disco and the, and the fella says, I mean, no, you can't come in, you're barred. <laughs> a Handful of Stars is um, is a place set in a, a snooker hall, a local Wexford snooker hall, a place where, where um, certain uh, rules apply. And the main protagonist of it is a fella called Jimmy Brady who's a small town rebel. Deliberately a James Dean type character, and he refuses to accept these rules and regulations. And he's constantly booking the system, he's constantly uh, pushing them and shoving them and answering back. When his, his his friend, the sidekick, doesn't. The sidekick's name is Tony, and poor Tony is only seventeen, and we discover that he he's just got his girlfriend pregnant, and he he's going to get married, two children really, and Jimmy was supposed to be the best man. Uh, the character I played in Handful of Stars is Tony. Actor, Aidan Gillen. He's quite a callow, gauche, kind of naive guy, you know, who works in a factory, like 19, 20 years old. And he's, um, you know, he's, he's friends with Jimmy, who's a, you know, he's a tearaway. A lot of times you'll get this, that a kind of a, you'll find a fellow who's like a tearaway, a rebel. We'll have a friend who seems quite square. The guy wasn't totally square. You know, he'd got this girl pregnant. He was going to marry her, you know. And he was, you know, so he was in a bit of a kind of a desperate strait, but he was going to conform to convention, do what, you know, the people around him told him that he had to do. Whereas Jimmy's character would have, you know, reacted to that in a different way, would have ran probably. Well, that's just the difference between them. You know, there were two kind of, two youngsters in the town and they were, you know, 
just represented opposite ends, I suppose, of the spectrum. A Handful of Stars was a huge hit on the fringe in London that year. And uh, I won a couple of awards for it, and and I was in big demand. But um, but the Bush were the ones that were going to get my second play, which became Poor Beast in the Rain. And halfway through writing that play, I, I realised that uh, there was another play ticking around inside me, and that I would probably write a trilogy. And that trilogy would end my fascination with Wexford. It didn't, but that's what I thought at the time. And um, Poor Beast in the Rain was performed then about two years later in the bush. And it was even a bigger hit than Handful of Stars, actually. Gary Lydon came back in to play Georgie. And Gary won an award that year, a Carrington Fringe Award for the Best Actor. I played the part of Georgie in the second of Billy's plays, Poor Beast in the Rain. Um, I suppose Georgie, thinking about it, Georgie was probably the antithesis of the previous character I played, Jimmy Brady, in the first play. He's an affectionate kind of fella, you know, and he's a nice, nice guy, you know, but he's just too nice for this, the girl Eileen, who's the woman in the play whose father runs the bang shop. And he's in, he's in, he's in love with her, but she, he... Um, He's never going to get her because he's not dangerous enough. She she likes, as he says in the play, he, that she she was like her mother. She was always after jukebox fellas and carnival boys, you know. Whereas uh, I suppose Georgie, you know, he wasn't like that. He'd be more like the kind of fellow that'd go home for his shepherd's pie dinner at the end of the day. A poor beast in the rain is um is set in a in a betting shop. My experience with with betting shops was that my my sisters, uh, my two sisters worked in betting shops, so. And my father had worked in a betting shop when he was a very young man, so he knew all the ins and outs, and he taught them the tricks of the trade. And so around dinner, we w- I would hear about bets and about um, scams and cons and about uh, different little things. Uh, the money that wasn't collected on bets at the end of the year or every six months was divvied up amongst the girls who worked in the shop. That was, that was obviously always one of the little bonuses of the job. Danger Doyle is a tear away... If you like, is a sort of a grown-up Jimmy Brady, who, of course, features in a handful of stars. Um, Danger Doyle has run away with another man's wife ten years ago, uh, leaving behind Eileen, uh, her daughter, uh, who now works in her father's betting shop. Danger Doyle, when in the play, is returning back to get Eileen, to bring her back to London, because her mother is, in a bad way, uh, a nervous, a nervous wreck, really. And Danger feels that if she saw Eileen again, she might be all right. Roach's world is the romantic world of film and popular song, where heartbreak and conflict derive from rugged individualism. Critic and academic, Christopher Murray. His first hero is a working-class adolescent in A Handful of Stars, whose rebellion is treated very much in a Marlon Brando stroke James Dean style. Roach's other heroes are more mature, but no less romantic and individualistic. Indeed, their individualism is in conflict with local community values, as in Poor Beast in the Rain, where Danger, the returned delinquent, is measured against the team spirit and patriotism inspired by the Wexford hurling team. The hero of the team is Big Red, whose jersey is displayed on stage, and it is huge. He does not appear in the the play himself, but his stature is mythic, and he is worshipped accordingly. Young George idolises Big Red, and shows the jersey with pride to Danger, and asks if he will ever be able to fill it. Danger, the real hero, assures him he will, or if not, that he'll be big enough as he is. I moved on then to my third play, which was Belfry, which would become the final uh, play in the, the Wexford trilogy. And um, and it's set, as the title suggests, in a belfry and a vestry of, of the local church. Um, again, it's, it's, uh, it's um, territory that I knew because I was an altar boy when I was young in this particular church. And... Um, so I, I knew the the the, uh, the rules and the uh, the duties that have to be performed here, the ringing of the bells, the serving of mass, and the um, disrobing and all of that jazz, you know, and uh, beautiful uh, theatrical uh, devices that you get when you you go into a church in a vestry. Uh, when I set out to write my third play, I didn't intend to write this play at all. I intended to write um, on such as we, which became my sixth play, I think. And On Such As We was um, set in a barber shop uh, owned by Oni. Um, and Oni was going to hold uh, a poker game every Thursday night. And, and um, the guys who, who frequented that 
poker game were going to tell me about only. And the first one I elected to tell me was a 45-year-old mammy's boy who happened to be the sacristan in the local church. And when he came to tell me the story, he decided he didn't want to talk about Oni, who was the barber's name, Oni. He didn't want to talk about Oni, he wanted to tell me a different story, and it was the story about when he had an affair with this woman. And for the next year or two, I was trying to unravel what Artie's story was, and it became Belfry. I played Angela in the uh, first production of Belfry, uh, which opened at the Bush Theatre in London. Actor Ingrid Craigie. She's a married woman. She works in the church. She comes in, she does the flowers, she cleans up. Um, she's a lovely, easy, friendly, um, sympathetic person. And she begins a relationship with Artie, who's this very innocent man. I mean, possibly even a virgin. She's absolutely in control of the relationship. She does an extraordinary thing for him. I mean, he falls in love with her. They begin a relationship. And he, she awakens him. Unlike the usual uh, classic relationship between a man and a woman, it's, like, it's often the woman who's awakened by love when she meets a man. But Angela, in this sense, is the, she's the mature of the two. She's the experienced partner. And he gives her a huge amount as well. And there's such fun and laughter and love and, and wonderful sex, too, in it. And then the shocking thing for Artie is he's such an innocent abroad. He falls in love with her. And he thinks they will run away together. And like a lot of the women in Billy's plays, she's completely realistic and pragmatic. And she just says, it's impossible. I mean, that can't happen. It's completely devastating, obviously, for Artie. But at the same time, because he has loved, he has become a bigger person at the end. He's lived and loved. And he's, he's going to go on now in a better way. I, I was commissioned to... Um write my fourth play for the, the Royal Shakespeare Company. I had this, this the bones of, of amphibians going around in, in my drawer. And amphibians is a play that um, is less uh, claustrophobic than the other plays, really. It's still set in Wexford, but it's a corner of Wexford that I don't belong in. Um, uh, amphibians, the very title tells you that they're, they're people who who uh, belong on the sea and on the land and are really at home nowhere. Um, and it's just a, another tribe of people, really, that have their own, their own rules and, and their, own, um, their own ways about them. Um, and within my story, uh, Eagle is the lead character and he, he's the last amphibian, if you like, fishing the river for salmon and fish. Everybody else have, has sold out and gone to work in the local seafood factory. And Eagle has a boy called Isaac. It's, it's inspired by the biblical story of Isaac. And um, he decides to sacrifice his son. And he brings him out to an island called Useless Island, which is in the middle of Wexford Harbour. And he's going to unearth an old tradition. That is to leave the boy alone for the night, build a specially shaped hut for him. And in the morning he'll come back and collect his son and set the hood on fire. And the boy shouldn't look back at the blaze because that is his childhood and he is now a sort of a miniature man um, and Eagle within the play Eagle was the last boy to fulfil that tradition before it was um, abandoned and we find that it was abandoned because twin, two twins were separated and one had to go to the island and we hear the story of the Dempsey twins and one of them tried to swim out there and be with the other and both of them died drowned wrapped around each other um, so it's uh, just one of these beautiful mythic images that the story sent to me the first time I would have come across Billy Roach, apart from just knowing him around the town, Wexford, uh, would be, you know, as a musician and uh, as uh, the leader of the Billy Roach band that, you know, we would have gone to see and uh, that, you know, they were a great band and, and Billy was a great songwriter. Wexford-born actor Barry Barnes played Rory in the 1993 Abbey Theatre production of Billy Roach's play The Cavalcaders. And music then, you know, has definitely come up again and again in the plays, and I suppose most especially in Cavalcaders, because, you know, a lot of Cavalcaders is about music. I, I, I do think that, that the music kind of serves a great purpose in cal Cavalcaders in that it lets the characters kind of lift themselves out of the kind of the mundane world and I suppose the pressure cooker world of the town 
and it lets the, lets them into a sort of a, a broader, more mythic world, you know, of song and the stories of the song, you know, and, and the expression of emotions in the song that mightn't, you know, they mightn't be allowed to express those emotions within the community, but, you know, once they open their mouths and sing, you know, all this emotion can come out. And I think that the the music works so well in Cavalcaders on, on, on that level, you know. And the other level that it works on is because it's a quartet, and it's harmony. It's it allows people to harmonise with each other, the characters to harmonise with each other in a way that they're not harmonising, <laughs> you know, in their day to day lives. The cavalcades have been going around in my head for a little while. Um, I'm fascinated by mythology of all kinds, but uh, but one of the myths that really um, got to me was was the whole Arthur and Camelot and Wasteland, Fisher King story, all all of that, you know. But how do you how do you take this, these myths and uh, and bring them to life in a small town setting? The shoe shop, in a, in a way, represents Cam, a Camelot. Terry, the main character in the play, um, when we first see him in the first scene, he's in the the here and now, if you like, uh, and he's he's not in too good shape, and the shop is quite dilapidated. It, it's it's the wasteland. We learn as the play goes on that he lost his wife to his best friend Rogan years and years ago and he never quite got over it he's illegitimate as most mythic heroes are Arthur was well Cucullin was um, being reared by his uncle Eamon who if you like is the Merlin of the peace and through his own fault in many ways he's allowed, allowed beautiful Camelot and the Holy Grail to slip away from him the Holy Grail of love and he's now living in a in a dilapidated world, really, where the briars have grown over. So that's the first scene. The second scene, we pull back those briars and we see what the cavalcaders and the life and the harmony that used to exist, or that they tried to attain, so to speak. You know, I think it's very interesting to look at, um, uh, you know, the world that Billy Roach's plays take place in. They're all set in a small town. Now, that happens to be Wexford Town. In some ways, it's immaterial that it's Wexford Town. The point is that it is a small town. And the thing is, the plays are set in this small town. They're not set in the next town. They're not set three miles out the road. They're not set on the other side of the bridge. They're set in the town. And the town has a very confined feel to it. And it's very limited in that way. And that's what makes it kind of like a pressure cooker. And that's what makes all the stakes very high because the characters are living within this community and anything they do, any little betrayal, any little secret love, anything like that, any secrets that they keep, you know, the stakes are very high because it's all in this pressure cooker of this small, small community. In other words, like, if things are not going well for a character in a Billy Roach play, he doesn't sort of say, well, I hop on a Ryanair flight to Paris, you know, for the weekend and get over it. You know, it isn't that, you know. He has to stay there and this thing has to be sorted out within this small community. The comings and goings might seem trivial or small or whatever. Actually, they're really, really important and they're really, really um, high stakes because of that, you know. It's this confined, enclosed community and you have the plus side of that, which is all the warmth and the comfort that comes from that. And the other side of that, which is all the claustrophobia um, and all the suspicion uh, that comes from that. And it's out of that that the drama with a capital D comes in Billy Roach's play. That's the way I always think of that. So that brings me on to um, my sixth play, And Such As We, which of course was the play I meant to write way back um, when I wrote Belfry. And I returned to this character, Oni, who was a lovable rogue, who was a barber, and um, this strange, lovable guy that um, gathers around him a, a selection of orphans of some sort, you know. On such as we, I deliberately set out to write a beautiful play, a hymn to love. And within the play, um, Oni f- becomes infatuated with this beautiful, this beautiful woman who... Uh, runs a boutique across the street from him. The town is changing because her husband is buying up the town fast and changing into plastic. He's changing wood to plastic and he's changing the face of the town. And Only is called old-fashioned and and Only says, uh, to say I'm a bit old-fashioned, I'm not a bit old-fashioned. I am old-fashioned and proud of it. Um, my father had this barber shop before me and I'm hoping my lad will have it after me. Um, 
it's a dream that probably won't come true, of course, but um, at least he's trying to dig in. Um, after On Such As We, I returned to prose again. I wrote a, a collection of short stories called Tales from Rainwater Pond. Twelve stories all in all, with each story having at its heart a strange, eerie place called Rainwater Pond, which acts as a kind of a silent witness to each story. I was delighted to get back to prose again because it's uh, it's clearly relentless writing for for stage, you know, and um, particularly my characters who are who are not particularly articulate characters. It's very it's very difficult to to um to find your poetry in the hands of a an inarticulate. So it's, it's, it hasn't been easy. To put the return to prose again, it's nice to get back to your dictionary and your thesaurus and and um, and deal with nature and uh, you know and and inner thoughts. I've also returned to Tumbling Down, which is now out of print and uh, has come back into my realm again. Um, so I, I rewrote Tumbling Down over the last year, um, touched it up, polished it up, gave it a little lick of, lick of paint here and there. Didn't change the structure very much. Sacked w- at least one character out of it. and um, So it, it's nice to get back to, to prose again. So, I mean, I, I feel a more rounded writer by doing that, you know. And also the stories I've been on the road reading the stories um, every place from Belfast to Cork to Galway to Dublin, all over Wicklow. You know, I've been all over the country reading some of the stories. Um, so that's been very enjoyable too. And uh, it's a very tricky art form, uh, very difficult to write. It took me seven years to write these stories. Uh, it it wasn't a detour. I don't want people to think I, I just took a fortnight off. Um, as far as I'm concerned, these stories are just as important as the Wexford Trilogy to me. And everything I know about writing has gone in there. So it's a, it's a, a little sore, it's a sore point for me, I have to say right now. But I, I mean, I realise the way the world has gone, you know. We're, we're, we're in a chewing gum world. People want to be happy all the time now. And, uh, well, you know, that's not our job. It's not my job to make people happy. It's to make them think and uh, make them feel and I suppose try and help people understand about life and, and take a second look at a character that you might cross the road to avoid. The playwright in profile was Billy Roach. The contributors were Barry Barnes, Ingrid Craigie, Aidan Gillen, Gary Lydon and Christopher Murray. The programme was compiled and presented by Sean Rocks and the producer was Kevin Reynolds. <laughs>